Hello, everyone, and welcome to this month's webinar on predictors for biologics in eosinophilic disease. This topic should really be of interest to everyone who's in, who is involved in eosinophil research and eosinophilic disorders, because we now have some hindsight on real world use of biologics targeting eosinophils and or type two inflammation. And now is a good time to try to draw some conclusions and lessons from what has been observed so far. For example, data is available in various disorders, allowing to determine whether the impact of treatment on blood and tissue eosinophilia translates into clinical improvement or not. There are also ongoing research efforts towards identifying biomarkers that can predict or reflect meaningful treatment responses. Next slide, please. So moving forwards, the pipeline of new biologics targeting type two inflammation is expanding and accelerating to the point that it's becoming difficult to include sufficient numbers of patients in these overlapping clinical trials. There will be an increasing need to position these different biologics in the therapeutic algorithms of each disorder. Next slide. We have a great duo of moderators today that pulled this program together, and they're both longstanding members of the International Eosinophil Society and committed eosinophiles. Manali Mukherjee is Assistant Professor of Medicine at the Division of Respirology at McMaster University, and Praveen Akuthoda is Associate Clinical Professor um, at the uh, University of California, San Diego. Next slide, please. Before starting the actual webinar, I would like to highlight our society's mission statement, namely with respect to sharing ideas and information about eosinophils and health and disease. We have been holding monthly webinars since the COVID outbreak and have, been out, and have had outstanding presentations and attendance since the beginning of last year. I would also like to draw your attention to our website address for those who are attending for the first time and who would like to see what ev events we organize. Next slide, please. So before we start, here are a few housekeeping rules. The most important is the fact that this Zoom meeting does not allow you to speak directly to the presenters. We therefore invite you to enter your questions into the question and answer box, and you can do that throughout the presentations. The moderator will address the questions to the, present, to the presenters on your behalf. Next slide, please. So it is now my pleasure to ask Praveen Akuthoda to join me so that he can introduce the first speaker. Thanks, Florence. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, my friend, Dr. Panice Corey. She's, um, and yeah, thanks for the next slide. She's a senior clinician investigator in the human eosinophil section of the NIH. And she's really a, a global expert in, in eosinophilic diseases, including hyper eosinophilic syndromes and does investigation in these areas as well. I call her when I need help with the, with the case. So I'm looking forward to her talk on positioning therapies in the, in the management of eosinophilic disorders. Panice. Thank you, Praveen. I need to share my slides. So thank you for the organizers for inviting me to talk about therapies in eosinophilic disorders. And when they first invited me, I, I said that there wasn't very much data, but uh, I will present what we have. So. Um, So the objectives today are to describe the eosinophilic associated disorders, including hypersinophilic syndromes, EGPA, and overlap disorders, um, and to describe the existing outcomes of clinical trials in these conditions, and then to explore some potential predictors of response to therapies. So hypersinophilic syndromes are um, a spectrum of conditions that have lots of different types of organ manifestations, but basically you have to have an eosinophil count greater than 1500 on two occasions, um, as well as uh, pathology related to that. Um, the types of conditions that are included in this large umbrella are myriad, and um, the most important uh, categories include myeloid uh, hypersinophilic syndrome, patients with lymphoid variant hypersinophilic syndrome, and those with an overlap condition. Essentially, uh, you can't distinguish really well between you know, EGID or EGPA and hypersinophilic syndrome. So traditionally, the conventional therapies for hypersinophilic syndromes included things like prednisone, hydroxyurea, interferon, um, cyclosporin. This was a study um, that came out of um, uh, Dr. Cleon's group with Princess of Bagu back in 2009. And what you can see here is really that <clears throat> uh, complete response is actually not 
uh, very common with these therapies, um, although some patients do have partial responses to, to these conventional therapies. And probably more importantly, um, when patients discontinue medications for HES, um, it's really related to lack of efficacy and um, in large part intolerance. And so what you can imagine is that um, these uh, conditions are very uh, problematic and we need better options for, uh, for them. Um, moving to EGPA, this is really an autoimmune uh, or inflammatory condition with potential genetic contribution. Um, these patients present with a, a large host of organ manifestations ranging from um, more mild uh, conditions involving the sinus and, and pulmonary um, systems to actually more severe cardiac or neurologic involvement. For the portion of patients who have ENCAs, um, where it's thought to be a potentially an autoimmune uh, manifestation, um, these patients might have more vasculitic manifestations, pulmonary hemorrhage, um, purpura, other uh, vasculitic complications, um, as compared to those that have more of an eosinophil phenotype, where patients present with airway involvement um, and eosinophilic gastrointestinal involvement in some cases. Um, so there really are different subphenotypes. The current guideline-based therapy for EGPA does position um, some biologics in those with um, active non-severe EGPA. So those patients who um, present that way um, can receive mepolizumab in conjunction with glucocorticoids or rituximab um, in conjunction with glucocorticoids. Um, and then those could also be used as add-on for patients who have relapses um, of various types. Obviously, those with more active severe vasculitic manifestations tend to get um, uh, pulsitoxin or um, rituximab um, at the onset. So we're really in the past decade now dealing with an explosion of research and uh, development of targeted therapies. And there are many, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I'm gonna present the ones where there is some data, um, including mepolizumab, um, benalizumab, either blocking the IL-5 um, cytokine or the receptor um, causing uh, antibody-dependent cell cytotoxicity. There's some data uh, using uh, lorentelumab to, to block um, cyclic eight in patients with EGIDs, and I'll mention some of that. Dupilumab does not appear on the slide, but I, I will, um, will not mention studies that are done in dupilumab, but just to know that there are some patients that have been treated that way. So starting with hypersinophilic syndrome, the proof therapies are mepolizumab, um, and there are some other agents in trials. So this was the original study uh, um, starting back in 2005, six um, and published in 2008 with Mark Rothenberg, um, looking at high dose mepolizumab in patients with um, HES. Um, these were all types of HES. And as you can see, the proportion of patients who um, had disease uh, worsening on placebo compared to mepolizumab was quite significant. Unfortunately, this uh, uh, mepolizumab was not approved at that time, um, and this was followed um, several uh, um, years on with a phase three a multicenter um, uh, trial um, looking at mepolizumab with a dose of 300 milligrams in patients with HES, and uh, this was published in 2020. What you can see here is that um, in patients who received um, uh, placebo compared to mepolizumab, there was um, much worsening in terms of the number of flares um, and also uh, time to event of um, flares was much worse um, in patients who received placebo as compared to mepolizumab. And this resulted in the approval of mepolizumab at a dose of 300 milligrams um, for HES. Um, but what you can uh, see here is that it doesn't matter which dose, 300 milligrams or 750 milligrams, um, patients with HES do have improved disease and reduced flares. The phase three study did have an open label extension uh, wherein patients received more doses of uh, mepolizumab and were followed on. So those who had received pre previous placebo um, denoted here in gray, uh, they actually did have improvement. It doesn't look as, as nice here, uh, but if you look at the, um, com in comparison to the prior number of flares, um, you can see that they actually did start to have improvement. However, um, in this study, no disease phenotypes or predictors of flares were included in either the primary or the open label extension study. So um, we started looking at different types of predictors to therapies in HES, um, and really we started this process in, uh, in the uh, form of glucocorticoids. And what we found looking at our patients who had received um, 
uh, glucocorticoid therapy for hypersinophilic syndrome is that there are patterns that start to fall out in terms of responses. And what became really uh, apparent in this um, uh, regression model that we built was that patients with lymphoid barrier HES have um, a worse response to glucocorticoids um, as compared to the index cases, which would be the idiopathic patients or the patients who had AGPA. Um, those with myeloid disease tend not to respond to glucocorticoids. And so we started really looking at these subtypes in uh, many of our studies. And this was a, um, a paper put together by Dr. Felai Kuang, um, who at the time was at NIH, uh, and looking at those patients who had received compassionate use mepolizumab. Um, and so looking at those who had received um, long-term long uh, mepolizumab for hypersinophilic syndrome, many at the higher doses, um, what you can see is that these patterns also are replicated. So those um, with idiopathic HES tend to respond, whereas those with um, lymphoid HES, they do respond, but um, at a lower rate than those uh, with idiopathic. Again, myeloid patients, these were all JAK patients, did not respond to map, and those with overlap conditions also seem to seemingly responded. So it appears um, at this juncture that those with overlap and idiopathic HES are more responsive to high-dose mevolizumab than those with lymphoid variant HES. So moving to benrolizumab, this was a, a placebo-controlled double-blind um, study in patients with PDGFRA negative um, HES. Um, uh, physicians were blinded to the eosinophil count and um, patients were on this placebo-controlled portion. And the primary endpoint was uh, taken at 12 weeks, uh, showing that the eosinophil count dropped in those receiving uh, venerolizumab as compared to placebo. And this is a striking picture from that paper uh, published in the New England Journal. Um, also, Fei Lai Kuang uh, was the first author. Um, and you can see the dramatic improvement in patients who received this medication. And um, where tissue was taken of the various organs, um, the uh, uh, tissue depletion was, was noted. And uh, this actually uh, led the way for a phase three trial that is ongoing um, uh, in Natron to investigate this in a larger group of patients. So map 30 milligrams um, was safe and efficacious in HES in a phase 2B study. Drilling down to the predictors, um, uh, this were the 20 patients that were included in that study. Um, and what you can see that um, comes up is that um, those patients with myeloid disease um, didn't respond uh, to uh, venerolizumab. Um, and not all, but uh, three out of the four patients with LHES also had relapses on venerolizumab. And this is actually uh, an interesting observation and um, uh, hopefully will be investigated further in, in studies. Um, so overlap and idiopathic HES, again, uh, more responsive than lymphoid variant HES. Um, biologics. So when I was first asked to give this talk, I said, you know, there's not a whole lot of data, Praveen, um, but uh, luckily, uh, um, owing to a big effort uh, led by Dr. Amy Cleon, um, several years back at the last in-person um, IS meeting, um, several projects were presented uh, talking about um, how to answer questions in this rare group of patients, um, where, you know, many of us see some of them, but, you know, across the country, there's not really a, a standard registry. Um, so we constructed these multi-center retrospective data collection um, projects, um, and this one was actually investigating the use of biologics in the treatment of HES. So the inclusion criteria required that you had to have a diagnosis of hypersinophilic syndrome and had received a biologic off trial. Um, 151 patients of various type types were included. And as you can see here, um, so many different biologics are used off-label in uh, patients with hypersinophilic syndrome. And here on the right, denoted in green, are those patients that were able to taper their background therapy. And so what's encouraging is that even though I presented some of this data about you know, lymphoid variant HES patients not responding as well, um, there are um, uh, you know, responses in terms of uh, tapering of background therapy. Um, and so from a, a clinical response perspective, you know, there is uh, some heterogeneity in terms of the response to different types of biologics. And I'm going to drill down um, into, in the next few slides on that. But overall, biologic agents did allow tapering of background therapy in most HES patients. So when we look at symptom improvement, which is really the, the burden that these patients experience, all the different types of organ system involvement that they have, um, what you can see is that um, this is a very busy slide, but I'm going to point you to just the um, overall findings. So um, for all biologics in idiopathic HES as compared to LHES, you see improvement um, overall with different types of biologics for patients with um, idiopathic HES. 
less so uh, for LHES, but these are small numbers, it's 45 patients uh, total included. Um, and so it'd be, it's interesting to see, you know, what types of um, symptoms uh, perhaps improved um, with the uh, biologics overall for LHES. And it turns out, you know, those patients with dermalogic involvement or pulmonary involvement um, tend to have some uh, improvement overall. Um, and so when we look at the ability to taper therapy, I think the most data exists for mepolizumab. So um, when you look at LHES, about a third are able to taper therapy um, as compared to three quarters for patients with idiopathic HES. And it's hard to really parse out um, what types of symptoms um, you know, are most responsive to, to mepolizumab. For idiopathic HES, it looks like there is a, a parent dose response. So those receiving three, uh, 300 or 700 milligrams more likely to respond than those on the 100 milligram dose. And um, with LHES, it's less clear. Again, small numbers, 14 patients included in this um, sub-analysis. Um, but it looks like those with dermalogic conditions tend to improve more. So overall, 75% of HES patients uh, and 66% of LHES uh, are able to taper their background therapy on mepolizumab. So moving to EGPA, um, the approved current therapies, mepolizumab, rituximab for various indications, and in trials, venralizumab. So the first double-blind placebo-controlled study of um, mepolizumab uh, performed for HGPA um, was performed and published in 2017. Mike uh, Wexler was the first author. And this study was a year-long study, double-blind placebo-controlled. Um, patients received mepolizumab or, or uh, placebo throughout. And these patients tend to have um, re either relapses or difficulty attaining remission. The study did demonstrate uh, an increased proportion of patients who were able to receive um, or achieve remission and um, reduced relapses, although you can still see that lots of patients still continue to relapse. But overall, this was a positive study. Uh, patients with HGPA had improved remission on dose of 300 milligrams of mepolizumab. Um, a sub-analysis was performed to investigate the impact of um, other perhaps predictors that might tell us which patients are more likely to um, respond to mepolizumab. Um, so the, the types of things that were looked at included prior relapses, baseline immunosuppressant use, disease duration, um, and refractory disease status um, on mepolizumab efficacy. And looking at all these things in general, uh, mepolizumab was fa favored regardless of whether or not, you know, you had less relapses, more relapses, um, had a baseline in, um, immunosuppressive use or not. Um, and then when you look at um, ability to reduce corticosteroids, um, more than 50% reduction um, and, and or uh, achieve um, clinical benefit based on any of these variables, there were really no differences. So mepolizumab was beneficial irrespective of prior relapses, baseline um, immunosuppressive use, disease duration, or refractory status. Um, although not specific to eosinophils per se, I do have to mention rituximab. Um, there's not a whole lot of data, but there was this one retrospective study looking at 41 patients uh, with a diagnosis of EGPA who had at least one dose of rituximab um, at four centers that were included in this retrospective study. Uh, response was uh, defined as a BVAS of zero. Partial response was defined as a reduction of 50% of the BVAS. And what you can see here is overall the BVAS scores uh, uh, declined in, in most of the patients. Um, luckily, they did um, enroll both patients who um, had um, ANCA positivity and negativity, so 44% positive. And uh, what came out was that those patients who were more likely to achieve remission um, had ANCA positivity as compared to those um, that were ANCA negative, and that was a statistically significant result. Um, and so, you know, this is obviously a, an option for those patients with an eosinophil phenotype and, and ANCA positivity, um, and those with ANCA negativity also, but perhaps a less likely to respond. Um, and then moving to benralizumab, um, this was a pilot study of benralizumab in 10 uh, participants at uh, National Jewish, led up by Mike Wexler. Um, a small study, a short uh, time period, uh, looking at whether or not metalizumab was able to reduce um, steroid use um, and improve uh, flares. And you can see here uh, that um, the uh, steroid use was decreased a lot by um, treatment with benralizumab, and also the mean annualized exacerbation rate was lower during treatment, so 1.5 um, uh, on average uh, exacerbations as compared to 4.6 in the post-treatment and uh, screening periods for those who received benralizumab. 
So phenols that was tolerated resulted in reduced GC um, use as well as decreased as exacerbations. And this is the basis for um, a larger study that is ongoing right now. Um, so uh, moving to eosinophilogastrointestinal diseases, um, there is uh, some data with dupilumab and EOE, I'm not going to present that, and some uh, data on lirantelumab um, in patients with HES. I'm sorry, uh, uh, EGID overlap with uh, eosinophilia. And this is a phase two study uh, looking at lirantelumab for patients with eosinophilic gastritis and duodenitis. And in this study, it was double-blind placebo-controlled. Uh, patients received um, lirantelumab uh, four doses, um, and they had to have enough symptoms to go into the study, so um, uh, quite sick patients. Um, uh, during this trial, uh, those patients who received lirantelumab um, as compared to placebo had a reduction in their um, overall um, symptom scores. And also there was uh, a tissue um, uh, a reduction also. So um, those patients who received placebo um, as compared to the various doses of larentelumab um, had complete uh, tissue uh, depletion of eosinophils. And this was published in 2020 uh, with Avendelin um, and also was the basis for a, a larger phase three study, um, the results of which are not yet published. So again, larentelumab improved symptoms and tissue eosinophilia in patients with eosinophilic gastritis and duodenitis. Um, and so then uh, benrolizumab and a five receptor in patients with HES EGIT overlap. Uh, so those patients that I mentioned previously, the 20 subjects that were um, uh, enrolled on the phase two study of benrolizumab and PDGFRA um, negative HES, um, of those participants, seven had a uh, um, gastrointestinal involvement as part of their HES, um, and uh, a sub-analysis was looked at to see whether they had tissue uh, improvement as well as um, uh, symptom improvement, and this was also published by Dr. Feilai Kwong um, just recently in Jackie in Practice. Um, of those patients with gastrointestinal involvement, seven out of seven um, reported uh, clinical improvement, although the time to uh, improvement varied. Um, all had um, resolution of the eosinophilia and the tissue biopsies that were obtained. Um, and interestingly, uh, those with colonic involvement um, had greater remission as compared and, and reduced flares as compared to those with um, upper uh, agent involvement. And I think this uh, um, highlights some of the differences that have been also found from a transcriptomic perspective in the Seeger Consortium. Um, data that was published by Tetsuo Shoda. Um, so I think this will be interesting to parse out. So in summary, uh, eosinophil associated diseases are heterogeneous. Um, multiple studies have suggested differential responses to treatments based on the subtype of disease. So my recommendation for HES is that future studies should really include the diagnosis subtype to better understand responses and to guide treatment. And as we um, hopefully parse out the pathogenesis of these conditions more, we'll be able to have better predictors. And then for EGPA and overlap conditions, I think more studies um, on disease phenotypes and potentially endotypes um, will be helpful to tease out the response um, by treatment. So thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thanks, Panise. That was an incredible talk. Um, we do have some time for, for questions, and I'll remind folks to um, put their questions in uh, either the chat box or the q and I'll, I'll monitor both, but we'll start with the question that uh, Samir Mathor put into the Q&A. And uh, Samir asks, in the steroid responder analyses, um, this was for the HES, uh, was the definition of MHES strict with genetic mutation identification, or did it include tryptase high without uh, genetic defect identified? You mean for the retrospective analysis? I believe so. Uh, Samir, you yeah, can so, type in the chat box if that's um, the case. Those were patients with a molecular abnormality of MHES. Great. Um, so I have a I have a question. Um, you know, while people are putting questions into the into the chat box, what can you speculate why you think LHES is less less responsive in kind of you know in multiple ways? You know, both to to, to steroids to Mepolizumab, you know, looks like to benralizumab as well um, compared to other other subtypes. What's what, what's different that makes uh, makes LEH less responsive? Um, I think it's, it's a really good question. I don't think we have all the answers, um, but since you asked me to speculate, I think, you know, there are different types of patients. I mean, so not all H LHES behaves the same either. And there's some that have much larger clones. So when we look at the aberrant uh, T-cell phenotype, there are some patients who have a 50% clonal burden as opposed to some that only have one or 2%. Um, and in my, I mean, my 
anecdotal experience, uh, it seems that those that have larger clones um, also probably put on a lot more cytokines and maybe more um, resistant. Um, I don't know if that's everyone's experience. I think there are also differences in terms of um, the types of biologics that are used and whether you're having true depletion in the particular tissues. So. Um, you know, certainly uh, if you have a large clonal burden and lots of eosinophils and, and clonal cells in, in your tissues, uh, it may be harder to achieve a response. Um, you know, we know with map that, uh, you know, you don't necessarily get full depletion of eosinophils in all the tissues. And so it depends on the type of tissue that's perhaps involved. Um, there are other theories in terms of, you know, the types of T cells. There may be, a, you know, varied uh, molecular abnormalities in the LHES uh, participants that we have not really fully teased out. So um, it's hard to speculate much more than that without actual data. Yeah, well, thanks for thanks for doing that much speculation. So we have a couple more questions that have uh, that have come in in the meantime. So Jeff Chup, one of our uh, speakers for later in the session, asks, "What is your hypothesis for the, for the relapses in patients uh, with HES treated with uh, with Benra?" Um, the so same, along the same lines. Along yeah. the same lines, um, you know, I think so. So Dr. Kwong has sort of investigated this, and and, and Dr. Flan in much more detail, looking at. Um, you know, factors such as anti-drug antibodies uh, to see whether those are um, affected and doesn't appear to be really the reason. Um, there have been in vitro studies looking at this and, and I don't think we have as yet a definite um, reason. Uh, if Dr. Klian or, or Dr. Kwong are on the call and want to speculate you know, further based on more recent data in the, in the chat, they can do so, but I'm not sure that we know yet exactly what it is. Um, Great. Um Get a couple more questions in here, rapid fire. Um, Florence asks, um, uh, for, e for EGID that seems to be particularly difficult to manage, do you have any data on responses to topical um, corticosteroids? For, for the patients with EGIDs? EGIDs, yeah, so this is shifting um, to EGIDs. Yeah, so, you know, there is some data um, about you know, compared to placebo using topical um, steroids uh, and different formulations. I think that the trouble with that is that we, it's hard to actually assess, you know, exactly where the steroids go. And so, you know, when we're talking about patients with, uh, you know, duodenal and beyond involvement, so including the small intestine all the way down to the colon, um, actually um, biopsying and improving responses is, is difficult. So I think there's not very much data um, to suggest exactly how these things work. There probably is some element of absorption that, that happens too, even though we say that, you know, a lot of the medications we use have high first pass metabolism. Um, you know, so there's not a good data, but uh, I think the type of formulation, you know, the, the release uh, performance, you know, whether it's delayed re release or it's crushed, I think is what people use uh, for patients with these lower EGIs. I don't have strict data to, to share, Lawrence, unfortunately. Great. We have um, a couple additional questions from Samir Mathur. Um, or, yeah, you know, the first is uh, my impression is that the MHES like uh, parentheses, high B12, high tryptase, uh, and parentheses without genetic defect identified do respond to steroid. Your thoughts? So that's not what we find. Um, you know, those patients with uh, the MHES like, you know, B12 tryptase, um, you know, and, and additional features. I mean, I think probably we are a little bit more strict in terms of how we define MHES. The, we're not just using those um, blood parameters, but other features, you know, dysplastic eosinophils, um, patients who have fibrosis or, or other um, ab aberrant um, phenotypes in the bone marrow, um, splenomegaly, you know, other anemia, cytopenias. So using all of those other additional features for MHES, it tends, you know, you might have a transient response to glucocorticoids. And we've seen that even in PDGFRA. You give patients with PDGFRA, you know, they, they don't necessarily have all clonal eosinophils. And sometimes they have a transient response to steroids. But um, in general, those patients with a myeloid phenotype in our hands have not responded well to steroids or, or don't, don't um, sustain a response to steroids, I should say. Great. And I think that might be the last question we have time for. Um, uh, Amy did, did uh, chime in with uh, uh, an answer to your uh, question about some of the data um, in her experience so that people can look in the chat box for that. And I will hand it back over to, to Florence for, um, uh, for, for the, the re actually to, to Manali Mukherjee for uh, introducing the next speaker. Thank you.
Thank you, Praveen, and uh, thank you, Panis, for that really interesting talk. Our next speaker lined up is Dr. David Jackson. Uh, he's an associate professor in respiratory medicine at King's College London and the clinical director for Guy's Severe Asthma Center at Guy's and St. Thomas's Hospital in London. And he will be talking to us about is targeting the Yasnapil sufficient for treating asthma? So looking forward to your talk, David. Uh, thanks, Manali. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to just share my uh, screen. Hopefully, you can all see it in a sec. Um, okay, I'm assuming you can all see this fine. So, uh, thanks very much for the invitation to speak today. Um, and uh, uh, really, I'm going to take a clinical view uh, of this subject. Um, we've now got an amazing opportunity by looking at responses to the biologic therapies to sort of almost, you know, reverse um, translate thoughts about mechanisms uh, by seeing responses in humans. Uh, so this is, uh, these are my disclosures. Um, and jumping back 104 years, uh, Rackman first wrote, the presence of an asinophilia in asthma is confirmed but its significance is not understood. And I could stop my presentation uh, right here and just say uh, that 104 years later, not much has changed because the presence of synophilia in asthma is confirmed uh, and its significance is still uh, not fully uh, understood. But we've definitely made progress. And this data from David Price, I think really tells a very clear story. Um, rarely do you see data where there is such a clear dose response. The higher the blood and sinophil count, the greater the risk of an exacerbation, the more difficult it is to maintain good asthma um, control. And what we do know is that inhaled steroids, which fundamentally are there to dampen T2 inflammation, do work in well over 90%, probably 96% of patients. They may not seem to work sometimes, but as is shown in this study here, patients on high dose treatment, once their adherence to treatment was optimized, once their inhaler technique was corrected, actually they became better controlled, really only leaving this sort of very small number of uh, patients with severe asthma, which really probably sit at around three to 5%. So the question then is, is targeting the sinophil sufficient for this 3.7%? Because we know already that inhaled steroids do the rest. So, Isinophils essentially are very responsive to inhaled steroids, as I've just mentioned. This is data from uh, bronchial uh, sampling on the left. This is both transbronchial and endobronchial uh, sampling, uh, looking at the change after a single month of inhaled steroids. Going from steroid naive to, to after one month of inhaled steroids, showing a very clear reduction. And on the right, this is data in this, from severe asthma, looking at the difference in blood isinophils this time, going from medium to high dose ICS. And from a clinical standpoint, we know that inhaled steroids, again, this is a study of one month before, one month after inhaled steroids, significantly improves asthma control. So day-to-day -day symptoms, these are two different questionnaires that we use in asthma, significantly improves lung function. So FEV1, how much air you can blow out in the first second, which is a mark of the caliber of the airways and the PC20, which is airway hyper-responsiveness. Often people think of airway hyper-responsiveness as somehow separate from T2 inflammation, but it is intrinsically uh, involved. And you can see essentially airway hyper-responsiveness pretty much subsides uh, when you dampen down T2 inflammation with inhaled steroids. What we also see here is pheno going down. Now pheno is not a marker of uh, acinophils as such, it's a marker of IL-13. And the problem with the acidophil story so far is that all the data that's come out until relatively recently shows that there's no question T2 inflammation is involved in asthma because in steroids work. But that doesn't tell you it's definitely the acidophil. Yes, there's you know, an association between higher acidophil counts and worse outcomes, but that could just be, be a marker of disease and actually other related pathways could be more important. So pheno here goes down. We know pheno is a marker of IL-13 because if you only target IL-13, as you, do, you can with lipokizumab, one of the antibodies that never really made it through to development, dupilumab also obviously targets IL-13, but also IL-4, so this is a more specific uh, 
anti-L13 biologic, you can see straight away pheno drops off a cliff down to normal levels. And on the right, these are two different doses of inhaled steroids. And I'm showing you this really to highlight the fact that, again, IL-13, as represented by pheno, is very, very steroid uh, responsive in most patients. So then, now we have the situation where finally we can say, actually, is it the eosinophil or is it broader to inflammation that, is, that leads to the improvements we see with inhaled steroids? And uh, as you know, mentioned in the previous talk, there are differences between the L5 site, uh, uh, serum neutralizing um, antibodies like mepolizumab and rosalizumab and venralizumab. Uh, very good data here on the right from um, Ian Pavard's group in Oxford showing the difference after a single dose of venralizumab in orange, mepolizumab in blue, and prednisolone, a high dose in green, in patients with severe eosinophilic asthma. You can see that after, you know, by four hours, you're dropping average uh, eosinophil counts from around 800 or so down to about 30 or 40. Um, so really, there is a dramatic difference. And this allows us then to really, you know, use venralizumab in this way to, to understand the genuine role of eosinophils, because with mepolizumab, whilst it's unquestionably a very good drug, uh, in severe asthma, it still leaves half of your eosinophils in your airway, half in the bone marrow, so you don't get a true um, picture in the same way. But what we now have from five years of data published relatively recently um, with benralizumab is that eosinophil that um, exacerbation rates are diminished in the majority. So in at least 75% of patients every year, they didn't have any exacerbations whatsoever, and you're seeing average rates of about 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 uh, across uh, the board. So the majority of patients with severe asthma, whose asthma is not being responsive to inhaled steroids, stop exacerbating when you target the eosinophil. But phase three studies, unfortunately, often contain subjects who perhaps weren't as severe as they were meant to be. And we know that by looking at placebo responses. And it's for that reason that we really need to look at real world data because inevitably the date these patients are much more severe. And so this, is, this was the first um, large real-world cohort that was published with venralizumab for, uh, came from our, from our center uh, in London. And this was 130 patients. You can see the patients are more severe. The baseline exacerbation rate was sitting at around five exacerbations in the previous year. And we're seeing reductions here of over 70% and good improvements in ACQ. So with ACQ, the lower the number, the better. The, the minimal clinically important difference is, is 0.5. A, a, AQLQ is the quality of life questionnaire, the higher the number, the better, and then you've got lung function on the right. But the question is, what are these residual exacerbations, uh, residual symptoms, uh, and so on? Overall, we saw that well over 80% of patients had a response uh, to venralizumab. Okay, and we defined response as at least a 50% reduction in exacerbations or 50% reduction in maintenance prednisolone. And we saw a super response, which, you know, for all intents and purposes, is almost like clinical remission. Patients totally stop exacerbating. Those who were on maintenance prednisolone every day are able to completely come off their prednisolone for asthma. And we saw that in almost half the patients. But thinking about these patients who did not have as good a response as we anticipated, the first thing we always ask in asthma is, is that because they're not taking their inhaled treatment every more, uh, anymore or on a regular basis? And um, uh, our farm, one of our pharmacists in our unit at Guy's, like Gwyneth and Kona, investigated this. And we first looked at it in the context of mepolizumab because this was the first drug we had available to us. But what she was able to demonstrate is despite these patients being initially adherent to therapy inhaled, steroids before giving, being given the biologic. And we assessed that objectively, looking at, in, uh, at uh, inhaler records, prescription records, and so on. What she found was that patients who stopped using inhaled steroids regularly after starting mepolizumab did not actually achieve the expected outcome, as you can see here. So poor adherence is less than 50% adherence to inhaled steroids. But in contrast, when, we, when she did the same analysis for benralizumab, we saw something quite different, which was that even in patients who stopped using regular inhaled steroids, it didn't appear to affect the efficacy of, of benralizumab. And fundamentally, this, I think, relates to the idea that, as we discussed, 
with mepolizumab, you're still, you've still got 50% of your airway eosinophils. With benalizumab, they're more uh, deplete. But leaving that aside, so we're still, it's not about adherence to ICS, but we're still seeing differences. And some patients are doing really well with benalizumab, suggesting eosinophil is very dominant, and those that are doing less well. And the one characteristic that really comes out most strongly is whether the patients developed asthma in adulthood or childhood, and whether they have nasal polyposis. And this is uh, the data from, from uh, our real world um, cohort showing this. This is the first column here, are the super responders. The second column are the responders. So these are still responders. They're not the non-responders because that number is too small. These are the responders excluding those super responders. And you can also see on the bottom highlighted, the higher the eosinophil count, the greater the response. And this is also seen in control studies. So this is the phase 3B RCT for benalizumab. And again, the same thing comes out. It's nasal polyposis and the age of onset of asthma. Looking at the, the first column on the left is the exacerbation right. The second is a quality of life measure. The third is an asthma control measure of daily symptoms. And the last, the FEV1 is, is lung function. So a consistent message here. And this is true of the other biologics targeting this eosinophils as well. So this is reslizumab now, um, uh, targeting IL-5. And again, data here from Guy Brussel clearly shows that according to the age of onset, broken down even more um, uh, carefully here, you can see that the rate reduction and exacerbations improves. Now, sometimes these patterns are simply because the placebo rate with prior to treatment is very high. And therefore, actually, even though there's different uh, rates, um, at different, there's, a, there's a pattern of better reduction in adult onset, actually it relates to the fact that this, there's a higher rate to start with and therefore greater reduction, but the baseline rate is the same. And so we looked at that and what we saw actually that that was not the case. So here on the left, what you're seeing here is the time to exacerbation. And it was clear that the adult onset patients did better than the child onset patients with asthma. So it wasn't simply about what the baseline rate was, it was the fact that they were, not, they were without question exacerbating more frequently and earlier um, than the uh, adult onset patients. And this was not seen for ATP. Often there's this discussion about how important allergy is and ATP is in the context of asthma. Maybe the eosinophil is important, but actually allergic inflammation is very important as well. We don't really see that. You can see on the right here, there's no difference between patients who are atopic and non-atopic. What we also looked at, shown here, is the difference. If there was a differential response to a drug like mepolizumab or benalizumab, and I'm showing you a combined cohort here of 230 patients, according to whether they were also eligible for omelizumab. So the co-eligible patients here, which are the dotted lines, they're the patients who could have had omelizumab because they're atopic, they're sensitized to different perennial area allergens, their IgEs within range, they're appropriate for that treatment, but they instead got mepolizumab or benalizumab compared to the straight line, which are the patients who are the patients who are only eligible for an anti-L55 receptor therapy. And you can see whichever outcome measure you look at, whether it's exacerbations on the top left or prednisolone reduction dose on the top right, or change in asthma control score, or change in lung function on the bottom panels, there is no difference whether or not you're allergic or sensitized to allergen A or B. And if you look at it a third way, this is the relationship between the baseline IgE level in the blood compared to the exacerbation rate. And you can see here in, with placebo in gray and uh, and Lizumab, this is a post-op analysis from the phase three data um, underneath it, it really made no difference what the IgE level was. And this really comes to the idea that it doesn't appear to matter whether it's allergy driving the eosinophils into the airway and asthma or non-atopic mechanisms. If you target the eosinophil, it appears uh, to work well from an exacerbation point of view. So coming back to this then, what are these patients? Who are these patients? What's happening uh, for the, in the ones that are continuing to exacerbate and have symptoms? Could targeting T2 inflammation more broadly or even non-T2 pathways improve outcome? Or actually, is it about the idea that, you know, these patients have had asthma for 30 years, 40 years, there's significant airway remodeling, and that remodeling and that limited airflow obstruction that they have 
it's just driving on ongoing symptoms, even though they are in what is essentially inflammatory remission. So initially we looked at this and we looked at the non-responders and they fell into three groups. The numbers are small, but they fell into three groups. The first were the, were the patients who did actually have a good response to benzodiazepam initially, but then lost that response. And they had evidence of serum neutralizing antibodies to benzodiazepam itself. And that was made very obvious by a sinful character, which was flat. And then suddenly they shot up to 500, 600. The second were a small group of patients that had chronic bacterial airway infection. Um, in our experience, these are patients who did not develop this out of the blue. And I don't think actually it's due to benralizumab, um, but rather pre-benralizumab, pre-biologic, they had these airway infections anyway, and the bacterial ones were sort of hidden amongst the larger number of exacerbations. And the third, which I think are the most interesting group, are the ones that have ongoing steroid responsive T2 inflammation. And this is the group I'm going to briefly talk about. When we actually had, uh, when we did this initial analysis, this initial analysis, we had 130 patients on benralizumab. And so this 5% is a very small number, six patients. Now we have about 500 patients on benralizumab. And so this number now sits at around 30. And I'm going to show you some unpublished data uh, relating to this. So the question then is, they don't have a good response to benralizumab, they're targeting the acinophil. Could they then have a good response if you targeted IL-13, IL-4 with dupilumab? The first thing just to remind you in terms of dupilumab um, and acinophils is that we know that IL-13 induces ataxin-3, CCL-26 in bronchial epithelial cells. We know that CCL-26 plays a major role in acinophil uh, recruitment to the airway. And there's data, nice data showing a very clear relationship between sputum levels of CCL26 and sputum acinophils in severe asthma. And in, on the bottom, you can see the impact of dupilumab, the effect of dupilumab on plasma ataxin 3 levels, levels essentially half uh, by the timing of the second dose of dupilumab, which is at, at two weeks. Now, if you look simply objectively, in an indirect way at the exacerbation rates on dupilumab versus the exacerbation rates on benralizumab, they are fundamentally the same. You see here rates of about 0.4. This is the, this work, this is about 40% of the um, intention to treat population of the, of the dupilumab, dupilumab studies. These are the ones that had evidence of T2 inflammation. You see rates about 0.4, which is basically what you see with benralizumab. So when you look at them side by side, there is no, good data to suggest that benralizumab targeting the acinophil in, in the way that benralizumab does is necessarily better than, than targeting the acinophil indirectly through CCL26 chemotaxis with dupilumab. It's also fair to say that even TSLP, you know, which is the latest of the asthma biologics, um, the data isn't better. Again, targeting the acinophil directly with benralizumab with, with exacerbation rates of 0.4 is the best you see when you take the subgroup of uh, um, patients with treated with tezapelumab who have nasopolyposis. You can see the patients without nasopolyposis, actually the exacerbation rate sits at around one. So targeting more isn't necessarily equivalent to better outcomes when it comes to T2 inflammation. But mean data hides certain examples where that's not the case. And I'm gonna show you now this group of 30 patients. I'm gonna start with a single case uh, here. This is a patient of mine, a 46 year old lady. And uh, she has severe adult onset atopic eosinophilic asthma. When I met her um, a, a few years ago at Guy's at our center, she'd been on daily prednisone at 20 milligrams a day for about five years. She had elevated T2 biomarkers with blood eosinophil count that varied between zero and 1200 depending on what dose of ICS she happened to be on that day. She had very elevated pheno levels of between 100 and 200 parts per billion. She was atopic in that she was, she was sensitized on skin prick testing to house dust mite, but it, it was clearly low level and, and not a contributing factor. And at the time, we only had mepolizumab available and we started mepolizumab and she didn't respond. This is, by the way, on top of 20 milligrams of PRED. We then switched to eslizumab, which was the next one available in our center. Again, she didn't respond, and subsequently benralizumab again, no response. 
We then wanted to know, well, is this because she's not taking her treatment properly, you know, her inhaled steroids or prednisolone? And what we do um, in some of these patients is what's called a phenosuppression test, which is essentially directly observed therapy, like, you know, historically we've done with TB therapy, where we watch a patient take their inhaler every day, uh, once a day inhaler, which is Relvar and uh, prednisolone. And for five days in a row, as an outpatient, we uh, measure their pheno level. And what you can see here is consistent high levels of pheno and sitting around 100. A normal pheno, by the way, is less than 25 uh, parts per billion. If this patient, by the way, hadn't been adhering to inhaled steroids, uh, after using inhaled steroids, this pheno would have come down quite quickly. And it did, not in response to inhaled steroids, as I've just shown you, but in response to dupilumab, which we started. And this is daily pheno uh, measures. Uh, and you can see here that from levels that, when we on the first day of dupilumab, uh, pheno was 150. By day you know, three here, it was already down to about 70-ish, and day five down to about 50, and that sat at that level. Not completely normal, but significantly better. And she was actually able to totally come off uh, prednisone, had a dramatic response uh, to dupilumab. So this was a single case, and this is now uh, unpublished data um, from our center on 32 patients uh, who are very much like her. On the top left here, you're looking at the exacerbation rates the year before starting the R5 therapies, so mepolizumab or benrolizumab. You can see there was a response. So these, it's not like there was no response overall in this group to uh, benrolizumab. So we saw a halving, but here we're aiming, we're aiming for zero exacerbation. So that was, that's always what we should be aiming for. And despite benrolizumab, which you're still, these patients on average are still having three exacerbations per year after a switch to dupilumab. Uh, these pretty much totally subsided. Uh, panel B, you're looking at asthma control, which again, significantly improved. Panel C, quality of life. Panel D, lung function, which interestingly hadn't improved at all with um, the L5 therapies and then jumped up with uh, dupilumab. Uh, and the bottom there, you're looking at the proportion of patients who were able to get their prednisolone below five milligrams. We, do, we look at this number simply because some patients need ongoing prednisolone for adrenal uh, sufficiency, they've been on steroids a long time and they can't completely stop without going uh, into uh, adrenal insufficiency. We did an analysis, again this is uh, unpublished uh, for the time being, um, looking at responses to, uh, you know, responder characteristics to this, you know, to this uh, treatment. Again, we're talking about small numbers here, it's 32 patients, but what did come out and was statistically significant was pheno. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the super responders these are patients, again, who have now become totally steroid free, you know, virtually in asthma remission, had a higher baseline pheno than the other uh, groups. So we're really looking at an IL-13 dominant uh, subphenotype. So to um, finish, patients with mild to moderate asthma, which who really make up at least 95% of the total, can be controlled with inhaled steroids, uh, which fundamentally confirms that T2 inflammation is central to their disease. For the remaining 5% or so, uh, data from both placebo-controlled and real-world studies suggest that targeting this infill is sufficient in many, but not all. And it's now clear that there are subphenotypes of eosinophilic asthma. And this, they, they most consistently relate to whether the patient developed asthma in childhood uh, or later life. For many adult onset patients, a sinful directed therapy literally is transformative. They feel like they no longer have asthma. It's really quite remarkable uh, to see. And now there's ongoing uh, a phase four study um, called a Shamal with benralizumab. And I can tell you, we've got about 30 patients in this study that, and this is a study looking at whether you can withdraw your inhaled therapy altogether. Uh, I can say that many patients now are able to literally use benralizumab as monotherapy, no longer having any systemic or inhaled steroid exposure, and still be able to maintain, still be able to maintain good asthma control. Some of the poor response to a sinifal depletion uh, can be explained by development of anti-drug antibodies and ongoing chronic airway infection. But once you've excluded these, we do see in about five to ten percent of and I'll put it in inverted brackets, uh, inverted commas, severe eosinophilic asthma, that the clinical response to what we presume is virtually complete drug-induced eosinopenia is suboptimal. 
And this represents a subphenotype of uh, T2 high, high asthma, characterized by a clinical response to high dose systemic steroids despite absent blood and sputum eosinophilia with IL-5, markedly elevated treatment resistant pheno, which represents higher levels of IL-13, and a very good clinical response uh, to dupilumab targeting the IL-4 receptor uh, following a switch from anti-IL-5 5 receptor. So I'll stop there. Um, just like to thank uh, people in my uh, team at Guys uh, who have done a lot of the work here. Joe Kavanagh and Andrew Hanna, two of my PhD students, have collected a lot of the data on mepolizumab and benulizumab. Gwena Dancona, our pharmacist, um, who looked at the adherence data and uh, many others in the team. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for that very enlightening talk, David. It is. Um, Fantastic, actually. I have a few questions for you, and we do, do have uh, time to take a few questions. So the first question that came from our president, um, Florence Ruffo, um, she's asking you, in the real-world study, is there any evidence that some patients with mild forms of EGPA, like those two are serum and negative, were they included because this was the only way to obtain treatment? I mean, maybe the studies itself, all the studies that you've showed. Could that be a possibility? That's what Florence is asking. So if I, if I understand the question correctly, so in our real world data, we haven't included EGPA patients within that cohort. Uh, we do have a, a separate cohort of EGPA, EGPA patients. We hope we'll be publishing quite soon a cohort of about 60 EGPA patients treated with benralizumab, and we've, we've published sort of small cohorts of data with MEPA and Benra as well. But the data I've shown is, is purely severe asthma, not, not EGPA. Okay. Um, the next question is from my uh, co-moderator, um, Praveen. So he's asking, it's a speculative question, do you think there is some path towards finding a true biomarker for predicting super responder to anti eosinophil therapy? Because clearly, blood eosinophils, um, they're insufficient. Uh, or is, uh, the, is it ultimately the endotype that's going to be defined by response to biologic? And to that, uh, Dr. Cleon, Amy Cleon ha, is asking, there is a flip side to that question. Patients who don't respond to dipilumab, but do they respond to IL-5, anti-IL-5 R therapy? So your thought process, please, on that, David. Uh, thanks. So in answer to Amy's question first, we, I don't have real world experience of that because uh, dipilumab has been the, the most recent uh, drug so far. So we, ha and we, we haven't been able to use it first line. So the rules thus far have been, uh, which, are, which have just, just changed in the last few weeks, actually. Uh, that we've, we've only been able to use dupilumab in patients that have not responded uh, adequately to uh, IL-5 therapies. But it'd be very interesting to know the flip of that. Uh, in answer to Praveen's um, question, uh, I actually don't think there's going to be a single biomarker um, that's going to identify super responders. I think there's going to be a, we're going to have a composite score that will take into account um, the phenotypic characteristics like adult onset nasal polyposis and so on, and the, and a sort of a, an endotypic biomarker like you know, blood eosinophils or you know, pheno or if, if it's something else that comes out. So uh, I think that's, that's probably going to be the case because I do think it is quite heterogeneous uh, still, even within severe eosinophilic asthma, I think it's heterogeneous. Um, so I, I do think it'll end up being a composite score, not dissimilar from like a cardiovascular risk score where you take into account you know, genetics of heart disease and smoking and blood pressure and cholesterol. I completely agree with you there. And in the interest of time, um, last question from Dr. Samir Mathur. Um, he's asking the groups of mechanism of non-responders is very interesting. Was such an analysis pursued for partial responders, those between 500 to less than 100% reduction in exacerbations? Could these patients also benefit for alternate T2 targeting maybe as multiple biologic therapy, like a dual biologic therapy? So I'm not, I'm not 100% sure I fully answered that question. The, let me see if I can bring it up on the chat and see it. So he's asking again, uh, could there be- oh, I've got it here, I've got it here, Manali, thanks. So yeah. groups of uh, mechanisms of non-responders. Um, so also been from alternate target. It's, it's possible, you know, the, I think what we need to do as clinicians actually, linked to that question, Samir, is, is not rest when we see a partial response and, you know, say, well, this is, that, this is acceptable, you know, we've reduced exacerbations from six down to three, great, you know, prednisone is down from 15 to seven and a half. I think we need to aim for clinical remission. So we should always be 
thinking about switching to a biologic that we believe may uh, have a better outcome uh, fundamentally. Um, not exactly answering your question, but uh, the the part the, the also thing that the numbers are small, so it's very difficult to do the, the subgroups in 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 those smaller you know, groups. Oh. Thank you so much, David. That was fantastic. And I'll pass it over to my co-moderator, Praveen. Great. Thanks, Manali. And uh, David, thanks. Fantastic talk. Really enjoyed that uh, wearing my wearing my asthma hat. Um, so also on the, in the theme of, uh, of, of severe asthma, I want to introduce our, our next speaker. Um, again, my friend, uh, Dr. Jeff Chupp, who is the director of the um, uh, Yale Center for Asthma and Airways Disease, and he's a professor of medicine at, um, at, at the Yale School of Medicine. Um, Jeff uh, and I have been working together on a, on a predictive pharmacogenomics um, grant that you know went in a few months ago, and we had some you know meetings, and in, in, in that in that grant thankfully has been funded, but we've been having some meetings over the last year, and uh, in those meetings, Jeff showed some data about eosinophils that he's going to show today, and I. I thought it'd be fantastic for him to, to talk to the, the IES community about, about his data. So I'm looking forward to his talk titled Characterization of Airway ESNFLs in Patients Treated with Biologics for Severe Asthma Using Mass Cytometry. So take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Praveen, and thank you for inviting me uh, to this, uh, this session. Uh, I am incredibly excited to be here. The talks were amazing so far, and I hope that you'll allow me to join. I don't know what kind of credentials I need to have, but um, I think it's uh, just really been tremendous. And I'm hoping to become a eosinophile, I guess is what the term I heard earlier uh, in the future. So I'm gonna show you some data from a, a clinical trial that was recently completed and presented at the Quad AI in children treated with mepolizumab and how we've approached uh, characterizing the eosinophils in the airways of these children being treated with asthma. Now, I'm going to start with um, my acknowledgments because I want to make sure that I uh, don't run out of time and that the proper people are acknowledged. Our group here, there's a, a number of individuals, but I want to single out Gabby Wilson, who's a fellow who's been working on this project uh, recently and has done a lot of the analysis of the uh, what you'll be seeing. Uh, Chen Lu is our uh, lab manager and then uh, Zeting Yan is the computational biologist who's helped us out. Uh, the brainchild of this whole project really uh, goes to the NIAID and the Inner City Asthma Consortium, Bill Bussey and um, Dan Jackson and Matt Altman. And then of course the sites that collected these sputum samples that you're gonna see from patients that were part of the industry, the asthma consortium, really tremendous group of individuals, Michelle Gill, Andy Liu, Meyer Catan at Columbia and Justin Schwartz and Patty Fulkerson at Cincinnati Children's. And then my co-PI Ruth Montgomery who runs the SciTop facility and James Knight, also another computational biologist. So, um, I think as we've uh, all zeroed in on today is that the, the eosinophils are really a fascinating cell, uh, especially in relation to asthma and have been used uh, very effectively as a biomarker um, in treating patients uh, with for years now. Uh, and one of the first papers published in the uh, Lancet in 2002 by Green et al showed that the um, sputum management approach by uh, titrating steroids uh, based on sputum eos was an effective way to improve exacerbations in patients with asthma. And we know, of course, now uh, by the data that's been shown today and other studies that anti-IL-5 treatment reduces exacerbation and improves quality of life. Um, and that the blood eosinophil is a very strong predictor of response to all these T2 therapies, but in particular, um, IL-5 therapies, anti-IL-5 therapies. And here you can see some data from Frank Albers from uh, GSK studies showing um, a uh, nice correlation with different levels of eosinophils and response to um, apolizumab. Now, Ian Pavord's data published in 2012 from the DREAM trial uh, 
was very interesting. Um, 94 patients, uh, we saw this significant reduction in exacerbation rates, of course. You could see that on the right compared to placebo, this various IV doses reduced uh, eosinophil uh, exacerbation rates down very low in, in many patients. Um, but the effect on sputum eosinophils was less clear. And you can see here that there was some reduction, but the significant difference in these 94 patients that uh, were part of the substudy that we participated in actually at Yale uh, was um, only at the 750 milligram IV dose. So there was an effect, but uh, certainly not obvious at the lower doses, especially at the 75 milligram IV dose, which is what's correlating with the 100 milligram sub-Q dose that we use today in patients with asthma. And when you've looked at other studies, for example, Dr. Mukherjee's work here showing when you treat patients with different um, uh, anti-IL-5 drugs, that sputomios do in fact uh, decrease, but uh, there are still eosinophils in the airway. And so you're not having the same effect on airway eosinophils as you do on blood eosinophils. And even more recently, although there has been some significance shown in some studies here uh, in the sputum reduction, uh, that data is still very limited and so the question is, what's happening to these airway eosinophils? And what can we understand them, the ones that are re maybe resistant or not responding to mepolizumab the same way as blood eosinophils? So we embarked on a study with the Inner City Asthma Consortium. As I mentioned, um, Dr. Bussey, Bill Bussey and, and Ruth Montgomery had met at a conference in China actually and started talking about this and I was brought into the the group uh, as a, a pulmonologist with expertise in sputum and um, at the time they were conducting a randomized clinical trial in children with uncontrolled eosinophilic asthma called Muppets 2. Uh, patients were uh, with eosinophilic asthma by standard criteria were randomized to receive MEPO, 100 milligrams every four weeks, or placebo for a year. And of course, primary endpoint was reduction in exacerbations over a 12-month period. And recently uh, presented at Quad AI uh, here in the US was the primary endpoint data, which showed there was a 27% uh, decrease in exacerbation rates in patients treated with MEPO uh, compared to placebo. Now, uh, because we got involved in this a little bit uh, after the initiation of the trial, uh, we developed a sub-study to examine the sputum eosinophils using a novel technology, CYTOF, which we'll get into in a second. And we identified four uh, of the sites um, that had the capacity to induce sputum in these patients. and. Um, at the end of the trial, because we couldn't do it before, because just practical reasons, um, we examined uh, as many patients as we could, which turned out to be 55 at the uh, end. And this all ended in the middle of the pandemic too. So that affected some of the recruitment. But at visit 14, which is end of treatment, um, placebo or MEPO patients, it was blinded, uh, induced sputum. And we um, examined these uh, sputum by Cytoff to look at the eosinophil, eosinophil subpopulations. Now, our hypothesis was, of course, that MEPO would decrease the level of sputum eos determined by Cytoff in children treated with MEPO. Um, these level would correlate with exacerbations in children. And then, of course, the more exploratory question here is that there was a functional status of these sputum eosinophils would differ among children that continued to exacerbate uh, compared to those that did not exacerbate uh, on drug. So the way this worked was at the end of treatment, these samples were collected at each of the site and inducing sputum in these children is not easy, of course, and just uh, tremendous uh, that the sites could do it. They were processed on site 
initially to uh, pull out the cell pellets and then the initial staining with our antibody panel for Cytoff was done there. They were shipped to Yale where we finished the processing and ran them on our Cytoff instrument. And then um, the analysis was conducted at Yale as well, both computational. And what we'll need to say is that there was a, <clears throat> we had a, a blood spike in to make sure that the quality of the samples was the same at each of the sites. We do a lot of normalization steps to make sure that the data is um, uh, clean. As you could see here, the normalization before and after. And then we also do two types of analyses here, which we'll get into. And that is we do a, a standard kind of gated analysis where it's like facts, but we have 40 markers that we're looking at instead of just you know three or four. And then we also do unsupervised uh, computational analyses. So we look at the expression of these markers on every cell that we can detect in a sample. And we look at it like high dimensional way so that we can understand the patterns better um, in the data. So you'll see some of that as well. Now, just a few words about Cytoff. <clears throat> you can see here on the bottom the standard approach to flow cytometry that allows us to immunophenotype cells. And here you can see that there's a curve for each of the fluorescent markers. And when you do this, there's overlap between the fluorescent channels that are picked up in the detector. When you have these fluorescent tags, you have to have enough separation between your uh, channels in order to detect a difference or that there's a, a, a specific signal, a fluorescent signal. So that limits the number of antibodies or channels that you can actually use to characterize a cell or look at um, mixed cell populations that exist uh, in sputum. With mass cytometry, you have uh, heavy metal labeled antibodies and they're put through a, a mass spec where the um, the signal uh, of each of the metals when they are hit by a laser in the mass spec shows a extremely distinct peak. You can see that here in the top panel. And when you do this, you can pick up a large number of metals uh, through these different channels. And so when you label um, antibodies with these metals, you have a much more, uh, a much higher number of, uh, of markers, both intracellular and cell, extracellular, that you can look at simultaneously. So this has become a very uh, increasingly popular way to immunophenotype um, cell populations in the blood, but we've been amongst the first to do this uh, in the airway, in particular, uh, in sputum samples and doing it in this trial actually and piloting this with the sites allowed us to develop this technology in for a multi-center format. Um, it's now actually increased I think up to 50 to 60 channels uh, so there's as this technology evolves I think we're going to see continued increases in the number of markers you can look at simultaneously. So with ICAC, uh, our sub-study partners, we developed a um, antibody panel to look at various markers relevant to eosinophils and um, severe asthma. And you can see here, what we generally do is we create a um, panel where we identify surface markers, standard surface markers that are used to uh, identify certain cell populations and you can see them here about 10 different cell populations that are typically looked at in the blood as as well as the airway and BAL. Then we also look at additional extracellular samples for example cyclic 8 and then um, EPX uh, antibody that we got from um, uh, Mayo to help us identify um, uh, eosinophils more specifically. Um, and uh, then, of course, some intracellular markers as well. Here you can see a number of uh, T2, T1, and T2 cytokines uh, that are 
uh, relevant to asthma and in particular uh, T2 asthma. And then with that, when we collect the data, what we do is we pull out the singlet cells from, we, this is like a standard fax gating. We identify the live cells based on some of the um, uh, other markers that we use to um, separate uh, live from dead cells. Then we actually pull out, uh, there's a spike in sample that we use for a control. But essentially what we're doing here is we're gating on the live single cells. And we have the capacity to really get down to just a, a few thousand cells in the sample. So even when a, a child doesn't produce a great sputum sample, as long as there's just a few thousand cells in it, five to 10,000 cells, we're actually been able to get pretty robust data and show that this sample is pretty similar in its general characteristics and quality to those uh, children that produce high numbers uh, of, of cells. And then what we do is we use our surface markers to pull out the various gates, uh, T cells, B cells, granulocytes, neutrophils, and eosinophils, and uh, NK cells, macrophages, CD11, and then ILC cells, uh, of course, as well. Now, the data I'm going to show you today is really focusing in on the eosinophil because that's really what we felt was kind of the, the critical to our um, project here and, and the target cell in relation to eosinophil. But as we move into this data set now that we have it, we'll be able to look at other cell populations. So here are the patients that uh, were treated with uh, mepolizumab. We're part of this uh, CYTOP substudy. You can see here there were um, uh, 53 patients uh, included in, in the study. Uh, we ended up using almost all of the samples. I think uh, 51 were actually included because of uh, quality. Uh, you could see there wasn't much difference between the patients treated with MEPO and, and placebo, and you could see their various characteristics here and they were, um, had elevated FENOs, and you could see their bloody O counts were, were pretty high at baseline, and their background exacerbation rate uh, was on average uh, two. We also did light microscopy sputum counts here just to have a, a, a correlation with our CYTOF data. And here you can see that um, There were typical changes that you you might see in patients what done is here consistent with what's been pushed in the literature with there is but the result on some residual cells. Now we also examine the patient. so part of the data that I'm gonna show you uh, is that uh, we looked at those patients who were treated with MAPO to determine what uh, to identify patients who had no exacerbations while on treatment versus those that continued to have exacerbations during the the year-long follow-up and then of course and here you can see again those numbers are getting pretty small we only have 15 patients uh, but what you can see here is the characteristics of their uh, cells by light microscopy was not that much different. Lower, but didn't reach statistical significance. Now, when we look at the gated cells by Cytoff, uh, you could see all the different populations of cells here. And I can tell you that most of the cells, looking at the CD4, CD8s, B cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, and K cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, um, and ILCs were all fairly similar. And here you can see that also by CYTOF um, that patients had similar eosinophil counts. And what's, I think, important, however, to recognize here is that we are able to detect a fair number of eosinophils in these patients 
uh, placebo group, of course, but also in patients treated with IL-5. So again, this highlights two things. I think that, you know, we don't have as much of an effect on airway eosinophils uh, as we do on blood eosinophils, but also that we have a technology here that even with relatively low levels, uh, numbers of cells has, we are able to detect an adequate number of cells for us to study them uh, functionally. And remember, these are live cells. Now, when you look at the patients by their exacerbation status during treatment, this is what we saw. So there actually was a significant reduction. So when you look at these patients here with no exacerbations during the follow-up period, uh, we could see that <clears throat> roughly split between these 15 individuals, you could see that those with no exacerbations had significantly lower numbers of sputomios compared to those who had one or more exacerbations. So still uh, within the level of control, but generally higher in those who were treated with MEPO. We didn't see any difference in the placebo treated patients um, between eosinophils, which you'd, what you'd expect. I'm not gonna show you that data, but that is in fact the case. Now, when we get into the computational analysis, this is what we see. You can see on the right here, what we did is we took all 40 markers, and I'm gonna show you that in a second. And we did a high dimensional clustering analysis of every eosinophil um, in the sample. So this included placebo patients as well as um, uh, MEPO treated patients. And when you look at the heat map on the right, you can see here that there generally fell into three different populations uh, of cells. Uh, looking at the dendrogram on the right, uh, on the left, you could see here we define these cells because of these three mark, the key markers that really separated them. And I'm gonna show you that in the heat map in a second. There are these cells that we labeled as EPX CD62L low, intermediate and high. And when you show these cells on a UMAP, which is just basically every dot on the map on the left represents a cell. You can see here several, how, how these cell populations map out. And in fact, you could see here that the low, intermediate, and high do in fact separate nicely with these intermediate cells being really most uh, further away from the lows and the highs um, <clears throat> compared to the, the lows and highs to themselves. So fairly distinct subgroups of eosinophils um, looking at it uh, in this kind of unsupervised way. Here's a heat map of all the data that just highlights this for you, that really shows at the bottom here, these uh, EPX high cells, CD62 and CD14. You could see the intermediates here that have high levels of a lot of markers. And then of course the CD, uh, the EPX low cells here that do have some increase in expression of, for example, IL-17 um, and other markers and IL-13 receptor one. When we start to look Subtypes of the Jeff, I think you might have had a little bit of an internet problem there for oh, a second. Um, I'm sorry, where did I where did I drop off? You were you were just starting that slide, and um, uh, I think maybe if you turn your camera off and restart with the slide that um, that you're at, maybe it might be good. To it was the shift in eosinophil subtype slide. 
and hopefully we'll get Jeff back in a, in a second. subtype was i at this slide the next one next one okay all right so i was just a, i said something incredibly profound so i have to say it again <laughs> <laughs> all right um so the um i apologize so uh, when you look at the all of the markers across these three different cell types, you can clearly see that there is a, a shift in expression of all the markers. It's not just these couple of markers that is different between these cell populations. And so we started to really get the sense that these subtypes of cells are actually potentially relevant, uh, not just um, in terms of um, their presence there, but perhaps could relate to uh, a patient's exacerbation status uh, on drug. And so we decided to look at that. You can see here um, there the shift is is somewhat telling, and I think we're getting into the, the details now about this, but you can see that there's different markers associated with each of the subtypes of cells. Now, when we looked at the um, when we looked at these, uh, the shift in what happens in patients who are just treated with MEPO, this is what we started to see. On the left, you can see that the total number of cells is really quite low um, in those patients that were not exacerbating. But because of the technology we have here, we have the capacity to look at these, uh, these numbers of cells. And this is the percent eosinophils based on the, the uh, number in the CD45 positive gate. And what you can see here is that really in these individuals who have uh, the kind of the most important um, finding here is that these intermediate cells that appear to be very active um, and but intermediate in terms of their expression of EPX and CD62 have um, a persistence in expression and those who continue to exacerbate compared to those that don't exacerbate. Uh, and this is significant. And you see that the low cells are shifting in the opposite direction. So there is a shift in eosinophil subtype based on whether the patient continues to exacerbate or not. And when we look at the actual T2 markers in these patients, you can see here that these intermediate uh, EOs, we call them, are actually have higher expression of IL-5 related markers, pathway markers, so both IL-5 as, IL, as well as IL-5 receptor, and um, IL-4-13 markers, so IL-4, IL-4 receptor alpha, which is the target of dupilumab, um, IL-13, as well as IL-13 receptor alpha. So this could present a, on some understanding of a mechanism, um, maybe specific for eosinophils, but could be relevant to other cell types that we need to look at, um, for continued inflammation or lack of response to treatment in patients uh, with on uh, mepolizumab. So in conclusion, um, we've demonstrated here, Muppets 2 demonstrated MEPO reduces exacerbations. Using CYTOF, we demonstrate that sputomios are not significantly reduced, reduced after treatment compared to placebos. So that's consistent with other studies, but that there is a reduction in patients that uh, don't exacerbate. Subtypes of EOs uh, appear to exist in children with asthma. Clustering analysis re revealed these three distinct types that I think we need to understand better and determine if this is the, the best way to subtype them. But participants who had exacerbations on MEPO had significantly higher levels of these intermediate type cells that have a persistence of 
T2 activation. And these cells could represent some of these uh, resident EOs versus inflammatory EOs uh, subtypes. But I think also importantly and relevant to our discussions today clinically is that um, it's possible if these cell types are present in the blood, which is something we need to look potentially look at, they could be used to help us uh, better select patients for treatment. And I think as Dr. Jackson mentioned, uh, potentially help us identify patients who might be better to be treated with anti-IL-5 versus anti-IL-413. So thank you very much. And I think we have a few minutes for questions. Sorry about the Wi-Fi issues. Oh, no problem. That was such a fantastic talk, Jeff. Um, it was it was worth the pause to let us digest uh, what we were what we were seeing. Um, yeah, I think um, well, I think we have time for maybe a question or two, and and Florence can can cut me off if uh, if we need to need to stop. But I'll, I'll start with a question from from Calvin Presson in the in the chat box. Um, Calvin also says great talk, and um, he asks, were cells permeabilized to facilitate access of monoclonal antibodies to intracellular antigens such as EPX and and, and intracellular cytokines? Uh, yes, there is a, after they, they go through surface staining at the sites, they get shipped to Yale and then we permeabilize them and then complete the staining. Great. Um, and then Manali has a very technical question um, about asking, was the sputum processed via the Pizzicini way or was the processing different? What is the minimum number of cells required for QC to get valid cytop results? Right. So this is a, these are interesting uh, questions. So we do the plug, uh, sputum plug method. Um, and we use a 40 micron uh, mesh filter uh, because we find, we do this for two reasons. Um, uh, I, primarily to try to reduce the percentage of squamous cells and uh, have a more uh, sample that's mostly inflammatory cells. And we found that I, uh, Dissecting out the plugs and using a 40 micron mesh filter allows us to get lower uh, uh, squamous cell percentages, higher quality sample. I believe that's the Pizzicini method. Um, the um, the other thing is uh, relate the other question related to um, uh, uh, minimum minimum number. Well, it's always a challenge uh, because you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So. You know, we tend to process every sample. And then uh, when we look at it, uh, we basically map all of the data. So we, we do a um, PCA plot where we actually map all the data for all the samples and we look for outliers and batch effects that way. And if there isn't any adequate, if there is an outlier, then we throw the samples out. So we threw out, uh, I think, two samples for this data set because we had they were outliers and generally correlates with low cell numbers it's probably somewhere in the you know five thousand to ten thousand cell range um <clears throat> uh, but my advice is if you go this route uh, because it's so powerful you know process the samples and decide on data analysis whether to uh, include it in your data set Great, uh, thanks, Jeff. That is, I think, all the time that we have. There's a couple other really good questions in the in the in the chat, um, but um, you know, maybe you can uh, ping Jeff off offline for for these these questions. Uh, I see a question from Mats, and Mats, I can uh, connect you with with Jeff for that for that question as well. Yeah, there are actually a couple other questions, so maybe maybe that would be nice uh, to to put the two people in contact. Thank you, Praveen. So this is the end of our webinar. Um, thank you all for attending. Thank you to the presenters and the moderators for these great talks, the great selection of talks. Um, next slide, please. So we have, uh, as I said earlier, monthly meetings generally held the last Wednesday of each month uh, at the same time as today. The next webinar will be on upper airway disease, so mainly ear, nose, and throat. Uh, uh, disease manifestations and the role that eosinophils can play in these disorders. Next slide, please.
And I would also like uh, to inform you that we are moving towards uh, organizing our next in-person meeting. So we have uh, really just uh, canceled completely the intermediate 2021 meeting and uh, shifted everything towards next summer. Uh, the next meeting will be held in July in 2023, and we have a great local organizing committee uh, at McMaster University in Hamilton, who, uh, with whom we're going to work to uh, pull together a nice meeting uh, so that we can at last uh, reconvene, not virtually, but physically. So thank you to everyone once again for your attendance. Um, I think that's all I wanted to show you. Is there another, is there another slide, Andrea? Yeah, so this is just uh, an email address if you'd like to reach out to the organizing committee and have any information about our uh, society, how to join, how to become members, what are the events that we're organizing. We're putting together a nice uh, series of events for trainees as well. So I really encourage you to go check our website and eventually uh, send an email to this address if you want any more information. Thank you very much and have a nice day.